good morning again. I, uh, I apologize to those who uh, were not aware that I was preaching in the class period this morning and so went to class anyway. But I have been recording these lessons, so uh, except for the very first one, I missed that one, but all the other ones I've been recording, so if you want a copy at some point, I should have them available. But earlier this morning, we talked about how to protect our zeal from being put out by Satan. And now we're going to talk about using our zeal. We, we may talk a little bit about how to spread our zeal as well, but we probably won't have much time for that. We're going to talk about using it. So remember how we're thinking about zeal here as a fire. And just as fire needs the proper environment to be able to burn, and it needs heat, and it needs fuel, our zeal needs those things as well. We must cleanse our hearts and purify ourselves to be ready to be zealous. Get rid of the things in our life that are holding us back. And we need to draw near to God who provides the heat for the fire of our zeal. And we need to burn those characteristics of Christ in our life. As we, in our zeal, we need to live out Christ. And we looked at some specific things that help direct our zeal in the right way. So then we talked about protecting it so that it won't go away. But now... Everything's in place. We, we know what to look out for so we don't lose it. But now we need to use it. So let's talk about what we can do in using our zeal. How can you change your corner of the world? The, what, what area you have influence on? What good can you do there? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world. 
your good works that you do in the Lord should be seen so that God will be glorified because people know that the good works you're doing are because of your service to God. In Acts chapter 17, <clears throat> there is something said about Paul and, and Barnabas. Actually, I think this is Paul and Silas, sorry. But it, it says when, when they did not find them, they were looking for Paul and Silas. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Some translations say they've turned the world upside down. Isn't that a great thing for people to be able to say about you? They've turned the world upside down. <laughs> but only when it's in a good way, right? The world, the world wasn't good. And in their zeal, they were teaching people to follow Christ. It would be great if, at least in our part of the world, they could say, we've turned the world upside down. So here are some things we can do to make good changes. Find a problem you can work on. Communicate about it. Find, find out how to be clear. And when you want people to help you with this, communicate what you want to do very clearly. Cooperate with the right people. Involve the right people to accomplish what you want to do. And when you have problems that come up, deal with them. But don't, don't let them stop the work that is for the Lord. So first, let's, let's find a problem we can work on. We're going to look at the example of Nehemiah in this. Nehemiah was uh, a Jew who was in, I want to say Babylon, but he wasn't in Babylon. He was in Media. <laughs> I think he was in the, the city of Susa. Uh, and he was the cupbearer for the king of the Medes and the Persians. But he was, uh, he, the, the Jews had already, many of them had already gone back to Jerusalem. They were led there by Zerubbabel. And then Ezra went. No, Ezra, and Ezra. And now word comes back to Nehemiah about what's going on there. So in the first three verses, it, it talks about you know what, what he was told. And it says that uh, they, they said that uh, in the end of that, it, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Mm -hmm. 
And this is a, a bad problem. And it's something that Nehemiah really cared about. Because this, these were God's people who were in danger as long as there were no walls there. But it was also something he was qualified to deal with. Now, I don't know how being cupbearer to the king made him such a good leader, but he was a great leader. He could organize things. He knew he could be the governor of that territory and get things done. And so he talked to the king about the problem, and the king gave him permission to go and to be the governor. And to, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Once he got there, he had to get the people involved in this work. Nehemiah, being zealous to do this great thing, wouldn't accomplish anything if it was only him out there getting the bricks for the wall, right? He could never build that wall himself. He had to get everybody involved. So he went out and he looked around. And he, 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 he examined everything exactly what needed to be done. And then he went and he talked to the people about it. Uh, in verses 16 to 18, he went and he talked to the leaders. And he explained the situation. I'm sure they knew exactly <laughs> what the situation was. They lived there. But, but he says, he said, you see that the walls are burned. The gates are burned. Let's build a wall. Very clear message. <laughs> it wasn't just, you know, we're unprotected here. I think we need to do something. He said, we need to build a wall. <laughs> and he had more detailed plans than that, but he's communicating, this is what we need to do, very clearly. And so it's, it's, it says, so they put their hands to the good work. Well, you have to have cooperation in these kinds of things. But you need the right people to be working. I'm, go I'm going to cheat a little bit and leave Nehemiah for a second. <laughs> And go back to Ezra. When they were building the temple there. When, when the people were starting to build the temple in Ezra chapter 4. The people around said, let us build with you. They said, we'll help. And he said, no, we don't need your help. You have no part in this. When we try to do some good thing, 
and the denominations come and they say, we'll participate, we want to help with that. They're not the right people to work, are they? We need, we need God's people. The ones who are zealous for the Lord. And there will be problems that come up. There's problems that will come from the inside. From inside the church. In Nehemiah's time, they had a, a problem where some of the Jews were making slaves out of other Jews. They, they were poor Jews, and so... The, the people said, well, we'll give you food if you sell us your daughters and your sons as slaves. And that kind of gets in the way of working, doesn't it? <laughs> it's hard to work side by side with somebody who's enslaved your children. Well, Nehemiah was angry about it. And he went and he talked to the people and he got them to repent. And uh, in, in verses uh, 12 to 13, they said, we will give it back and we'll require nothing from them. Yeah. They agreed. We will do what God has said. We're going to stop being greedy and selfish, and we're going to love our brothers. And we'll have problems in the church like that. Maybe not slavery, but problems where people are abusing their brethren. Or just not treating one another in love. And those are things we have to take care of. Because as long as those problems are there, we'll never be able to work with all of our zeal that we should have. But in getting other people's problems sorted out, one reason they were willing to listen to Nehemiah so quickly was he was a different kind of governor than the ones they'd had before. The ones they had before had been taking taxes from them and, and you know, living really well. <laughs> But Nehemiah said, I, I didn't take anything from them. Uh, for 12 years, Me, neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. And uh, he said, I did not do so because of the fear of God. And the last sentence there is, I also applied myself to the work on this wall. We did not buy any land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. This uh, the last um, 14, 16. Verse, verse there. <laughs> Uh, 
In his zeal for the Lord, he set an example for others. He made sacrifices that everybody could see. So when he comes to them and he says, you, you need to stop taking these things from your poor brethren, they can't say, well, you tax us. Now, he had a right to tax them, but he didn't do it. And so it, they were willing to, to follow his leadership because his zeal was evident in the way he treated them. But there's also problems that will come from the outside. Problems outside of the church. People who are making accusations, gossiping about people in the church. In Nehemiah 6, the enemies of the Jews started making these accusations about how Nehemiah had set himself up as king. Yeah, they were trying to make trouble for them with the, the people back home in, in uh, the Medes of, the king of the Medes and the Persians, try to make Make them have trouble. So what do you do? Well, you, you do not let those things stop your work. Uh, they, they told Nehemiah, hey, we've heard all these things about you. You need to come out here and talk to us about it. <laughs> In Nehemiah 6, verse 3, he said, So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? When you're busy with the work of the Lord and people come around saying, hey, the Church of Christ, they're Satanists. They can make all kinds of accusations about it. Do we need to stop everything to deal with those accusations? No, we carry on with the work. It, we can answer those accusations, but we don't have to take a lot of time to do it. In verses 8 and 9, it says, Then I sent a message to him, saying, Such things as you are saying have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. So people come trying to cause trouble for the work of the Lord. You can tell them, look, what you're saying is not true. And you turn to God, you pray about it, and you keep on with the work. Steady work, as we talked about a little bit this morning, what zeal is. And these are some things that we find 
in their zeal, Nehemiah and Ezra both together led the people in certain things. And zealous leaders of God's people today, I think, should lead his people in the same things. One thing that they did was they celebrated their victories. When they accomplished work for the Lord, they got together and they had a big celebration to the Lord. When we accomplish something good, can we get together with our brethren and give praise to God for that? Yeah, that's a good thing to do. To worship the Lord in praise because of things he's helped us to accomplish. Another thing they did was they got all the people together and they read to them from the law of the Lord and explained it to them. You could say they had a group Bible study. And that's a great thing for zealous people to lead others in learning and Growing in the word of the They led the people to be leaders in their families. Now, as far as I know, both Ezra and Nehemiah were single men. But they talked to the leaders of the households. And they gave them responsibilities. They were going to, to lead their families in building the wall. But they were the leaders. They, the, the heads of the families led the families. And another thing they led the people in was personal accountability. When they saw the people sinning, they didn't just ignore it. They went to them and they said, look, this is what the word of God says. This is what you're doing. You need to repent. You are responsible. And they would get each man who had sinned by marrying a foreign wife, for example. They got each one of them to come and admit his sin and agree to take care of it. It wasn't just as a group we've we've committed sin. Personally, each person had to take responsibility for what they did. In doing this kind of leadership today, zealous for the Lord, we're probably not going to affect the whole nation like they did. But we can use it to change the part of the world where we are. Another thing we need to do in using our zeal is do the things that we're best at. I have a picture here of a man who was skiing in the, the Winter Olympics. 
But it's the Paralympics. He doesn't have any legs. There's a lot of things this man can't do, right? But he learns how to use the things that he has to the best of his ability. He can't be flexing his knees like other skiers. He has to use his upper body more. We need to not look at, well, I can't do these things, but look at what we are good at and use that. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given you gifts. And that's not only salvation. He's talking here about abilities that we have. So he says, find a way to use it to serve others. So when we're finding our best areas of service, we'll look at three things. What actions are does God require of me, of everybody? What actions accomplish the most good? And least important, what actions make me feel the best about what I'm doing? But when we look at what actions are required of me, well, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, but having the same spirit of faith, according to what it is, what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Teaching people about God is not an option. If you believe, you need to speak. That's something everybody's supposed to be doing. Our worship to God is something everybody is to do. We talked a little bit this morning about singing. That's commanded of everybody, isn't it? Now, if you don't have a voice and you cannot physically sing, that's one thing. But otherwise, we're to sing. We're to pray. We're to do all these things of worship to the Lord. That's... That's not just saying, well, I don't feel like that's something for me. Everybody's to do those things. And you're to be holy to God. Everybody is to be holy. In James 1 verse 27... It says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, 
ukuhambela izintandane nabafelokazi osizinwabo nokuzigcina kungabi nacala lokwezwe We need to be busy doing good and staying away from evil Taking care of the the people who are in trouble like the orphans and the widows is not something for just a few that's everybody who has true religion there's a lot of things we could look at under that category but look at if it's something god has required of you then you must do it it's not an option then you can start looking at other things things that you can choose what you're going to be involved in and you want to find out what's going to do the most good you know you can you can be busy with good things and not really accomplish much but we want to look for things that will have good accomplishing uh, things that will accomplish a lot of good we need to make priorities what did jesus do He looked at things that, that he could be busy doing. That were good things. He could heal a lot of people. He could be preaching. He could be praying. He could be training the apostles. Well, what did he do? He prioritized. He didn't just try to heal everybody, did he? He did heal a lot of people. But that was not as important as teaching the word. It was actually to accomplish the goal that people would listen to the word. He spent a lot of time in prayer. A lot of time training his his disciples. And there's a lot of other good things he could have been doing. He could have run a charity maybe. I mean, they were busy they they had a treasury with his apostles and they gave to the poor he could have spent his time really building that up to be a really good tra- uh, charity but other things were more important for him to spend his time on and then we can ask well what makes me feel best about what i'm doing i mean there's there's some things that we can be involved in that we don't really enjoy You know, when I helped Mzwandili and Siobonga and some others put together the Zulu songbooks. That is not something I like doing. I don't like having to stack all the papers on top of each other and staple and do it over and over and over again. But that had a lasting good, so it's, I'm glad I did it. But there are other things I feel really good about doing. 
When I get up and I'm able to explain the word of God in, in a way that people get good out of, that makes me feel good. When I write a program that shows the songs up here for us, that makes me feel good. I enjoy that. Because I'm putting skills to use that not everybody has, and it makes me feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> and everybody, everybody has their things that they enjoy doing and that are good to do. Okay. But again, that's the least important thing. We must first be doing what God has told us to do. And then trying to do the things that will have the most lasting good. And then we, we should do some things at least that we really feel makes us feel good because that encourages us to keep on doing these good works for the Lord. And lastly, we need to spread our zeal to others. Hopefully, if we're really living a zealous life and leading others, that zeal will rub off on them. But of course, we don't want them to catch fire just from us, right? <laughs> Their zeal needs to come from the same source as ours. We don't want them to be zealous because, oh, Wesley is so zealous, so I, I'm going to imitate him. Because Wesley's fire is going to burn out at some point. He'll have to rekindle it. It's not a perfect source of zeal. <laughs> now you must follow me instead. <laughs> now we must follow God. He is the source of our zeal. He's the perfect source. He provides the proper environment. He makes us pure. He provides the heat through his love and his grace and his zeal. He sets our hearts on fire. And Christ provides the fuel for us to live out, to burn in our lives. And so when we are spreading our zeal, we're trying to lead people to have that same love and knowledge and wisdom that comes from God. We're sitting down with people and we're trying to train them like Christ trained his disciples. We're like Peter in his old age writing those letters to stir up the brethren. Let's be busy with our zeal. All right.